Welcome to Southgate. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, if you are joining in with us today that you are connected with a local church. Uh, we hope and we pray that if you're in the North Grenville area that you are connected to Southgate in a physical way that you are coming out to services and you are joining in on the events that are happening in person. And if you're wondering how you can get connected to some of those things, uh, we would just say that you could sign up for the email uh, that uh, goes out weekly as well. You can follow us on our socials and uh, check in on the website to see what is going on in person and in our community. And so uh, we want you to be connected in that way. And uh, if you want to participate in what we are doing by giving financially, that will be up on the screen. We hope and we pray that this service is a benefit to you and your walk with Jesus. Well, we are on our fourth and final week of our series, King Jesus. Uh, thank you so much for sticking with me through this. I hope that this has been something beneficial for you and your faith journey. Um, and I hope that, that this is, uh, th this is a, a series that, that will, that will help you as you Talk about the gospel with your friends, with your neighbors, in your homes, in your communities. Um, and uh, if you are joining us for the first time today, uh, we have been going through a series talking about the gospel. And how this is a word that was used, uh, not necessarily in religious contexts to begin with. Um, and it was an announcement of a new king. That's what the word gospel was about. It was an announcement of a new king. And, and the gospel that we cling to as followers of Jesus is the announcement that Jesus is king and he is the completion of the story that began in Genesis. And that story is a story where, where God had created a good and beautiful world uh, in which he, he desires to have his human creation uh, rule and reign as he would, as his image bearers. Uh, this is the design that God made. And this plan went off the rails when humans decided that they would rather image other things. And when we do that... It has disastrous consequences. Empires emerge based off of fear, greed, and lust for power. We call these empires by the name of the one that they originated from, Babylon. Jesus confronts the evil not just in Babylon itself, but also the power that lies behind Babylon. He does this in a way that no one expected by dying on a cross. How on earth does dying on a cross accomplish anything? Well, last week we talked about how the cross reveals two things. It reveals the darkness of sin and evil. And on the other hand, it also reveals the love of the Father willing to die to save his children. Today we're going to take a deeper dive into this as we, uh, as we talk about all of the ramifications of the gospel. Well, we, we don't have time to talk about all of the ramifications of the gospel. This, this announcement that Jesus is king I'm sure if we, we wanted to take time to dive into all of this, we would take thousands of messages to actually get through all of the implications that come from the gospel. And that is, that is essentially why we do this church thing. We are now left in a place where we unpack what it means to be gospel people, what it means to be followers of Jesus. And where we left off last week was that Jesus had been dead for three days. And, and three women went to visit his tomb 
only to be met by an empty tomb. And the announcement that Jesus was not dead, he was very much alive. I've, I, I've used this quote before, but I, I feel that it is powerful and relevant once again. Uh, Esau Macaulay wrote in the New York Times, he wrote this, Easter is a frightening prospect for the women The only thing more terrifying than a world with Jesus dead was one in which he was alive. They did not go to the tomb looking for hope. They were searching for a place to grieve. They wanted to be left alone in despair. The terrifying prospect of Easter is that God called these women to return to the same world that crucified Jesus with a very dangerous gift. Hope in the power of God. The unending reservoir of forgiveness and an abundance of love. It would make them seem like fools who could believe such a thing. See, the good news is actually terrifying at times because it's much better than most of us have been led to believe. In fact, it's much better than I could ever communicate in just a few messages. The fact that Jesus is king has a massive impact on the world as we know it. And if we dared to believe it, We would see God's kingdom realized in ways we never could have hoped for before. See, the good news is better. It is so much better than what we sometimes simplify it down to. And we're going to talk about a few ways in which the good news is actually better than how we most often portray it. And so we'll start by by saying the good news is better because of what it means for the presence of God. What it means for God's presence. See, this idea of the presence of God was, was something common in the ancient world. But the presence of God was always found in a temple. And the Israelites... They adopted similar beliefs about God, that he would have his presence in first their tabernacle and then in their temple. But what we saw was something interesting. When we, when we looked at um, how Ezekiel talks about the exile, we saw God's presence actually going with the Israelites into exile. And last week, one of the things that we talked about was how John has actually said that, that God, God's presence has, has come to tabernacle, has come to dwell among us in the person of Jesus. And something interesting happens when Jesus is crucified. See, there was this section in the temple called the Holy of Holies, and it was, it was separated by uh, the rest of the area by a, a large curtain, a large veil. And, and this was meant to be the, the place where heaven and earth met, where, where God's presence was so powerful, in fact, that, that when priests would go into the Holy of Holies, they would actually tie a rope around their waist and they would have a bell attached to it so that people would know that the priest was still alive when he was in the Holy of Holies. And, and there were so many purification rituals that needed to happen before he went in. Uh, the, the fear was if he died in there, no one could go get him. So they actually attached a rope so they could pull Pull him out if he died in the presence of God. And so there was this idea that God was unapproachable. His presence was too powerful. And on the cross, when Jesus dies, uh, 
In Matthew 27, it records, And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. Now, often what we, what we talk about when we talk about you know, the crucifixion of Jesus and the presence of God and this, this idea of the Holy of Holies now being open is we say, well, now we can approach God. Now we can come to God in a way that we couldn't before. The presence of God is a reality that we can experience. And that is true but I want to tell you that it's, it's not necessarily a full picture. See, we think that the, t- the tearing of the veil means that we can now enter in, when in reality it does mean that, but it's so much better than that. It actually means that God's presence, God's spirit is being unleashed to the rest of the world. That God's spirit is actually moving away from the temple. And what Paul will eventually say is that we, the people who believe, have become God's temple. We have become the place where God's presence meets earth. And so what does this mean? How does, how does God's spirit being, being spread out and sent among his people. What, is, what does that do? What, how is that important? Why does that make the good news so much better? Well, Paul puts it this way in Romans 8, 11. He says, And the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. What it means is that you and I have access to the same spirit that led Jesus in his ways of living, in his ways of of dying and in his ways of being resurrected from the dead. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in the heart of those who believe. This is amazing news. This means that we have access to the same spirit that led Jesus in his victory over sin and death. And what that means is that you and I, we can have victory over sin and death in our lives. And so that leads me to my second point. The good news is better because of what it means for death. Recently, um, when asked uh, on on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert about how his faith um, and comedy interacts, Stephen responded by saying... A large part of his faith is related to the idea that death is not defeat. Because this is true, we can laugh at something as dark and sad as death. And in the same way that sadness feels like an emotional death, it's not if you can find a way to laugh at it. Laughter keeps you from having fear over it. And fearing death and sadness is what causes us to turn to evil. Think about it this way. Most of the evil in this world would boil down to some notion of self-preservation. The idea of kill or be killed. Given this choice, most would kill. But Jesus said with his life, it is better to be killed than to kill. It is better to have evil done to you than to become evil in an attempt to avoid it. Do we see what's happening here? This this idea that Jesus laid his life down, it becomes a formula for defeating death and evil itself. Don't give in to the temptation to become the thing that you are trying to avoid. That is what Jesus showed us, is that you don't have to fear death and in so doing become evil yourself yourself. 
And in this way, he, he completely takes away the power of death. Because the power of death was to incite fear. And this is why, this is why Christianity exploded in its early years. Because people were being killed left, right, and center. And yet the thing was exploding. Why? Because Christians didn't fear death. Because Jesus had disarmed the power of death itself. Paul puts it this way, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Thanks be to God, He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The good news is so much better because it tells us something powerful about the disarmament of death. Which leads us to the next point. The good news is better because of what it tells us about sin and evil. See, we often like to have the analogy of, of, of our sin debt being paid off. Paul talks about it in these terms. It's a fair way to talk about it. Uh, he, he says in Colossians 2.14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. See, we have this idea that, that we're in some kind of debt because of our sin. It needs to be paid off in order for us to be kind of legally, legally fair, legally equal, legally on some good ground. And again, this is, this is not wrong, it's just not full. See, most of us were led to believe that the gospel is about just being taken out of debt, somebody paying off our debt. And I often hear the gospel referred in this way. And again, it's not wrong, it's just not full. See, Paul goes on in this, he goes on to, to verse 15, he says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He talked about, we talked about this last week. Jesus doesn't just come to pay off a debt. He comes to completely eliminate sin and evil. He comes to destroy it. He comes to do battle with sin and evil. See, we sometimes think that, that this analogy, this idea of just having our debt paid off is all that we need. And in reality, um, anybody who's struggled with money knows that, that it's not just an issue of having all your debts paid off. Because more often than not, when somebody has all their debts just paid off for them, they don't have the tools to continue in a life that is going to flourish. And often, those people will end up in debt again. See, if all we need is to have our debt paid off, why does evil continue? Why do we still struggle? And I think it's because we don't have a full picture of what the gospel is actually telling us. And like we said before, what we need to understand when we see this full picture of the gospel is that we have access to the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God who is going to lead us into a way of, of living that is far better than the life that we were living before. We don't just need our debts paid off. We need to move into a new way of living. We need to understand that God's kingdom is about a new reality for life. And we need to live in that. Paul puts it this way when he talks to the Galatians. He says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He, he, he says that this new way of living is going to produce something greater. 
And if we would lean into the Spirit, we could have victory over sin and evil. Not just have it paid off for us, but that there's something greater that we would live into. I think Satan would love it if all that we thought was that we need to, we needed to be taken care of in one moment, and then we can just move on. The reality is, Jesus calls us into something bigger, which leads to the next point. The good news is better because of what it means for the image of God. See, Jesus comes as our king, not just to be some kind of figure that that is unattainable. He doesn't come to just show us how much better he is at this human thing than we are. He comes to give us an example of a way of life that we have always been called to live in. In fact, this is why Paul refers to Jesus as a new Adam, a new humanity. One author puts it this way, that that Jesus didn't sin, not because he's fully God, but because he wanted to be fully human. And to be fully human, to live out what it means to be human, is to actually not sin. That is the call that God is giving us. Jesus has actually restored the image of God. He has shown us what it always meant to be human. Paul writes this to the Colossians, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Not the lastborn, but the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the head. He is our leader. He goes before us. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Jesus is the better image bearer, and we are to look to him as our model, as our representative. We are to look to him as a way of living life. He has given us an example to follow, and that doesn't begin the day that you, did, the, the day that you die. That begins here and now. And that leads us to our next point. The good news is better because of what it means for here and now. See, Paul continues in his letter to the Colossians. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. See, we talked about this at the very opening of this series. One of the problems with what we consider to be a gospel message is that it just isn't big enough. The scope is not there. The good news really does go beyond just where you will go when you die. 
Notice that, that it says that Christ is reconciling all things to himself. Not just all people, all things to himself. And it says that this is the gospel you have heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. This is so much bigger than just where you go when you die. It is about the here and the now. And this misunderstanding that it's just about that, it it can be detrimental In fact, I was listening to a comedian be interviewed earlier this week. And this is what he said about how shedding his faith was one of the most important decisions he made. He said, religious faith for me was the ultimate in procrastination. It was about the next life. He was never told about the here and now implications. He was never told about the obligations towards one another. He was never told that the good news that Jesus is king means that we are being offered something far greater than just a ticket to heaven. We are being offered a new way of life. This is why Jesus chose the phrase, I am the way, not I am the payment. This is why Jesus said that the kingdom is coming. The kingdom is near. The kingdom is at hand. Not, you'll get to the kingdom later. And this is why, ultimately, Jesus, when he was asked, teach us to pray, he responded with this. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy, may your name be separate. May your name be something that is honored in this world because of your image bearers. Your kingdom come, not get us to your kingdom someday, but your kingdom come, your will be done. How does the kingdom come? When your will is done here on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Only give us what we need. This is an echo back to a moment in the desert where the Israelites were given manna from heaven and they were told to only take what they needed for the day. Give us today our daily bread. May we be dependent on you for everything that we need. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. It's your forgiveness that allows us to forgive others. It's your kingdom breaking through us that allows us to break the kingdom through to others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, because that is ultimately what the cross has done. It has delivered us from the evil one. We no longer have to fear death and do evil because of that fear. We can look at death and we can say, where is your sting? And lastly, what is often added As we pray this prayer, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is how Jesus taught us to pray. And growing up as a child, I went to a church where we would close every service with this prayer. And I I learned to pray this prayer at a very young age. And I didn't always understand what it was all about. But now, as an adult, this prayer has power. And if we truly meditate on these words, if we truly declare these words every day, I believe we will see the kingdom break through. This is why I'm teaching my children to pray this prayer every night. Because although they may not understand it fully yet, we are going to center ourselves around this idea
that ultimately the goal is that we see God's kingdom come and we see it ruled over by our King, Jesus, as we live and strive to follow his example. May we see his kingdom come. So we've got a couple of next steps that I'd like to jump into, some questions maybe to challenge us throughout the week. I hope that, that these will be something that, uh, that, that challenge you in your faith, and I hope that it brings you closer to your King, Jesus. Number one, are you living in resurrection power? Have you decided that you want to access that same power that raised Jesus from the dead? Or are we sitting in death and defeat? Have we just thrown up our hands and said, well, we'll just wait for the end? Because we are called as followers of Jesus into resurrection power. Number two. Will you take up your role as an image bearer, following in the ways of Jesus? This is what we are invited into. See, Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection. He hasn't given up on the initial plan to rule and reign through people. He says, now that you have seen, now that you have seen the love of the Father, now that you have seen that death is defeated, now that you have seen that, that all of these things are happening, now that I have accomplished these things, I am empowering you to return to your role as an image bearer. Will you follow? That is the question that is before us. And number three, should you make that decision to follow Jesus? Add the Lord's Prayer to your daily routine. Whether it's morning, night, afternoon, whatever. Join with the people who for thousands of years have been reciting this prayer as, as a central request that we bring before God, centering our hearts on this idea that, that Jesus taught that the kingdom is near, the kingdom is coming, the kingdom is accessible. Through him, through his spirit, we have access. I pray that we would not sit and wait when we are called to go and announce the good news. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are king. Thank you that because you are king, it means a significant difference in our world. And as much as the enemy would love us to live in a way in which we didn't believe that you were king, I thank you that you have empowered us by your spirit to live and to follow in your ways. I pray, God, that we would have the strength and the courage to do that. Be with us as we pray for your kingdom to come, your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, all for the glory of your name. Amen.